with these videos, we're aiming to create an online library where if you don't manage to come to Full Circle uh, or any of our events that we think are worth putting up, you can come uh, in your own time and look at this video and learn about the topic. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Matt is going to put up our slides uh, starting at the beginning. Uh, there's the first one, just to give you a, the framework of what we're going to talk to. We're covering something about the forests and the coffee in Southwest Ethiopia. Uh, three of us are speaking from a team of several staff in three different faculties at uh, Huddersfield University. Uh, the structure for our short presentation is as follows. Uh, I'll introduce Southwest Ethiopia to you and a bit of the approach that we at Huddersfield have been following. Matt will then be looking at uh, the PFM approach or participatory forest management approach that we've been following and some of the lessons learned, particularly linking to markets. And then Phil will be looking at some of the ways we're able to monitor the impact of the work or the impact of coffee production in this area. So I now just have three slides to introduce you to our particular area of work. Starting with a quick review of uh, the forests in the southwest and where we're talking about. So we're looking at the southwestern part of the northern highlands in Ethiopia and that's overlooking the lowlands uh, going into the Su South Sudan. Um, Afro-Montane rainforest uh, going up to 2,500 meters above sea level. Uh, a fairly wet area with only one uh, short dry season of between two and four months. The southwest highlands of Ethiopia had about four million hectares, so it's estimated of forest in the uh, 1950s, but that has been halved over the last uh, 70 years. One thing we might want to just make a note of is that Forest loss has been slower in areas where coffee has been uh, growing or coffee has been grown. Uh, this is an important area for biodiversity. It's uh, an extension of the Albertine Rift uh, biodiversity hotspot. Uh, in some of this forest, we do have coffee arabica growing wild, but it's very patchy. If you average it out, it's probably only about seven plants per hectare, but you get stands of the wild coffee. And of course, this is controlled altitudinally. Uh, it doesn't grow much below a thousand meters above sea level and goes up to about 2,000, uh, sorry, yeah, 2,000 uh, meters above sea level. Um, also, density of the canopy can affect the presence of wild coffee. And there's discussions that the uh, wild pop animal population in the past have created clearings which have allowed wild coffee to uh, do well. Whereas if you get very heavy canopy, that makes it more difficult. Okay, moving on to the process of forest and coffee in the coffee development. Um, this area is recorded as the source of a number of trade items from the Middle Ages. Uh, the earliest reference to coffee seems to be in the late 17th century, 1680s, something like that. And coffee coming out uh, carried by mules to Red Sea ports for export from there or for use in the Northern Highlands or other parts of the country. Commercialization of coffee production in the Southwest really dates from the 1940s uh, with roads beginning to go in uh, after the Italian occupation. Um, and uh, the road network is important, but so too is the mule network still used within the forest. We've had a process of altering the natural forest in areas which are suitable for coffee. And that's by transplanting wild plants from uh, stands with, deep within the natural forest to more accessible sites around the edge of the forest 
and creating what we might call a coffee forest uh, with varying density of, uh, of plants, up to several hundred uh, wild coffee plants per hectare. We do have backyard cultivation of coffee and there have been estates established in the southwest for coffee, uh, not the dominant means of production, but estates, uh, private and uh, government run, which have now been privatized since, um, uh, since the 1950s. Uh, and using the natural trees as canopy, but also as the natural canopy over matures and dies, so planted tree canopies. And finally, my last slide goes to the sort of work which we at uh, Huddersfield University have been doing in partnership with uh, an, an Ethiopian NGO, Ethio Wetlands and Natural Resources Association, and also uh, the government, particularly of the southern region of Ethiopia. And we've been looking at uh, introducing participatory or community approaches to forest management, PFM, and also testing if that approach can not only be supportive of maintaining the natural forest, but can also be supportive of conserving in situ the wild coffee. So we've been using this PFM approach to trying to maintain the forest and the wild coffee. Other NGOs have been and government departments have been looking at using biosphere reserves as another approach. Our work has mainly been particularly relating to coffee in Sheko district, which is towards the west of this block of forest in the southwest, uh, building the capacity of the communities to manage natural forest and coffee forest. And we've been mapping, uh, as Phil will tell us, uh, the presence of wild coffee and whether it is being sustained and maintained by using PFM. But we've also been working in the east of that big block of uh, forest in the southwest, trying to map the extent of coffee forest uh, and the change in that. And my colleagues now will, will take over. Matt will uh, talk to you now on uh, the PFM approach and that aspect of our work. Thank you. Matt. Thanks, Adrian. <coughs> so I'm just going to see if my screen will flip forward for me, which it doesn't seem to want to do. Hold on a minute. Just a second, uh, Priscilla. All right, there we are. Okay. So building on um, <coughs> building on Adrian's introduction, um, I wanted to outline a little bit more about the the approach to participatory forest management or community management um, that Adrian has just sort of begun to introduce. And I think the first thing to say is that there are sort of three key uh, uh, components to that, rights, responsibilities, and revenues. And I'll come back to those shortly. But so the approach to participatory forest management that Huddersfield has developed along with Ethio Wetlands Natural Resources Association and with the communities in Bent Checo is a sort of a seven step process, which begins with creation of awareness around participatory forest management and uh, an assessment of interest at village level. Uh, that follows on with um, an assessment of potential sites that would be suitable for PFM. And then the project staff sort of facilitate uh, boundary discussions, demarcation and mapping between neighbouring uh, communities and blocks of forest. The next step then is to move into the creation of uh, village level um, and then sort of parish level uh, management institutions, so forest management groups and forest management associations. Um, and then uh, that all becomes formalised then with a series of forest management boundaries, forest management plans that outline sort of um, the sustainable use and limits set on the forest resources, and then the roles and responsibilities of the communities um, alongside government. And then there's a formal agreement called a PFM agreement that's signed between the communities and local government. And really the, you know, Huddersfield and EWNRA seek to facilitate that process. 
Um, and for me, one of the things that I've really um, relished and, and, and thought is, is most important about this process since I joined Huddersfield is the focus on um, devolution of discussions right down to the village level, so the got level in Ethiopia, which is actually one level below the lowest administrative unit. Um, and I think that's really important because what's the, what that has done is it's helped us to learn, and it's been a very iterative process over the last sort of 10 years or so, um, it's helped us to learn what works and what doesn't work. So alongside the creation of this seven step or, or the adoption of this seven step process, which results in a PFM agreement, then we have been able to provide support in terms of uh, one of the NTFPs, non-timber forest products, that exists within this area of Sheko, and that of course is coffee in relation to this uh, uh, full circle event. And the support that has been provided has been twofold really. I suppose it's been technical support in terms of improving knowledge about harvesting, the importance of getting the fresh cherries um, quickly onto drying racks, um, the importance of proper drying, storage, and then subsequent revenue generation. And then the other side has been slightly more technical in terms of provision of drying meshes and watertight and secure uh, buildings uh, in which the coffee can be stored. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to say just quickly about the PFM process is that at the outset, it was about a two year, so 24 month process. And then over time, we found that that could be shortened um, because it was quite onerous. And so we managed to get it to about 12 to 14 months in terms of duration, which seemed better for, for everybody concerned. I just quickly wanted to share with you um, the uh, achievements of two of the cooperatives that we have um, helped to establish uh, in Sheko. So going back to my earlier point about the uh, forest management institutions, there are the forest management groups themselves that take responsibility, for instance, for patrolling and monitoring the forest, for ensuring sustainable offtake of different forest products, and so on and so forth. There are the forest management associations that are kind of a collective representation of all of the village level groups. And then there are two cooperatives um, that have been set up in two blocks of forest to sort of face one another. And the cooperatives provide you know, the sort of usual support that, uh, that co-ops do and provide a, a, a marketing outlet. So on the left-hand side here, you can see that there's Amora Gedel Forest Products Cooperative. And that is the one that has specialized in wild coffee. And by wild coffee, we mean the coffee that grows deep in the natural forest in which there's very little human uh, uh, manipulation, and uh, an interaction and it really is incredibly dense uh, forest which is very rich in biodiversity and what you can see over the sort of four or five years here is that um, after an initial peak in terms of the wild coffee that was harvested um, we were looking at about just over two tons to two and a half tons that were being harvested in 2017-18 and 1819 and 1920 that sort of doubled and, and, and those levels were maintained at about 5,000 kilos. On the right hand side, you can see Conte Berhan Forest Coffee, which, um, uh, although it looks, <laughs> I, I, I've not represented it very well, but the, the bar charts are much higher. So, in terms of the, the volumes of coffee, if you look at the first couple of years, we're looking at about 75 to 100 tons of forest coffee that were harvested and sold through the co ops. And then there was a huge jump uh, in 2018 19 to uh, more than 400 tons. And then that has sort of since been sustained. And that is the um, coffee, which is not growing deep in the really, really wild sort of forest, but it's more on the outskirts and where you, it kind of bleeds out from this very dense forest to somewhere you've still got some undergrowth that's non-coffee. And then somewhere really all you've got is primarily coffee as undergrowth and then the forest canopy. Um, and for me, it was really, well, for all of us, it was really interesting to try to identify what it was that had led to these steep increases in the production of, uh, uh, of the coffee. And I think there were several factors here. Uh, um, so first and foremost, 
um, the provision of kind of technical support led to an improvement, quite a significant improvement in both quality and prices that were being paid for the coffee from Ben Checo. So as you can see here, the price that was originally being paid was about 47 to 50 Ethiopian burr per kilo. And that sort of doubled to 100, 114 uh, burr per kilo for the forest coffee um, when we first started this work. And um, the wild coffee uh, was retailing about 132 burr per kilo. And another achievement from a quality perspective was that the uh, forest coffee achieved a grade three, which so far as we're aware, and this predates me by about a year, was the first time that coffee from uh, Ben Checo had achieved that grade. Um, and the wild coffee uh, was given a specialty grade two. And I think that those two factors, plus the fact that the communities could see that the co-ops themselves were uh, paying dividends, were operating quite transparently and had a very good uh, uh, um, village level representation in them, led to what you can see here has been quite significant increases in the co-op membership. So sort of a doubling on the wild coffee membership over a five, six year period and more than a trebling on the, uh, the forest coffee one. I think the other point that I just want to end on quickly here with this slide, and then I've got one more quick slide, Priscilla, is that um, we undertook or we, we um, uh, brought in an independent evaluator in 2016 who compared the rates of deforestation in PFM project forest compared to non-PFM forest um, in Sheko and uh, the rates of deforestation or forest degradation were at about 0.18% per annum in the PFM forest compared to over 2% in the non-PFM forest. Now there are lots of factors that go into that and there'll be lots of um, a, a sort of local variation, but it was quite an encouraging finding. The last point that I was asked to talk uh, about really was both the challenges and the opportunities, um, because it's certainly not all, <laughs> it's not all uh, uh, easy going all the time. As we heard yesterday in the video, um, right at the end of the day, it's quite a male dominated value chain, uh, it's coffee and we have constantly been seeking to try to increase female representation and participation, both at, at institution level and in the value chain. One of the other things that's been very interesting to see is that in terms of the people picking the wild coffee at first, um, that responsibility of those, that kind of employment opportunity, seasonal as it was, was given to young people in the towns, but actually their commitment and dedication was slightly questionable. And so that was then changed and people and villagers living in and around the, the wild coffee areas, in fact, took on that responsibility and that seems to have improved the quality. The other thing that we have had to deal with is shifting preferences. So at first the co-ops were selling direct to buyers, but then buyers preferred to go through the unions, I think because it was a less resource demanding kind of process. Um, and most recently in the last sort of year or two, um, the wild coffee co-op has struggled because the unions have been offering the same price for wild coffee as for forest coffee. And so understandably the farmers have been saying, well, why would I go and you know break my back kind of going deep in the forest to pick the wild coffee when I can get uh, more forest coffee in, in the same amount of time. Um, we've also tried to support the PFM agreements by introducing um, communal land certificates which are legally recognized within Ethiopian law and which come in to complement the PFM agreement so should uh, anybody try to take any of the forested land from the forest management groups, um, the groups would actually have legal recourse and also be paid uh, um, or compensated for any value added that they had been able to bring to it, to the forest area. Um, and I think perhaps the, the last point that I want to end on um, uh, is the point about the, the biodiversity. So we have been trying to monitor and assess um, the wild coffee stands and the forest canopy, and also trying to look at the genetic um, diversity, both in the wild coffee and the forest coffee areas. And there's more work to be done there. And there's more work in other non-coffee timber forest products as well. But the, there's been some really exciting developments that Phil has been leading uh, in terms of monitoring the wild coffee. And so I'm going to end now by handing over to him and he will uh,
finish off the re remainder of our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Matt. And could you please move into the next slide, please? Just a minute, Phil, it's just frozen again. <laughs> So you don't want it to. <clears throat> I'm just going to minimize the screen again and just see if that. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. All right. So the uh, Adrian and Matt talking about the conservation of wild coffee. So it's very important we understand uh, we know whether actually a uh, wild coffee conserve in a natural forest like uh, by the uh, PPM or, or other conserv management planning there. So for that purpose, we, we conducted survey in 2015 and 2019. And then we selected about 30 site. And then this site was monitored by local uh, forest uh, management groups in Sheko. And you can see in the, uh, in the photo, uh, the, the group of people, um, uh, they counting white coffee. And also you can see on the map, uh, you can see the, the number of the selected site on the map. And this site actually uh, distributed about 11 different local communities. So yeah. And then uh, Matt, could you please next one, please? Next slide, please. I'm, I'm just trying to get that Phil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> There you go. All right. Okay. So, so we uh, divide the uh, the coffee trees between like a mature mother tree and sapling and uh, seedling, and it's based on a uh, height of the tree. So anything above one meter, we uh, we consider as a mother tree, and then anything between uh, zero point five to one meter, we call sapling. Obviously, uh, this definition may differ and from other purpose, but for the consistency, uh, we use this uh, definition uh, between 2015 and 2019. And in, you can see on the table, uh, the, the result from this survey between 2015 and 19. And we saw a slight decla uh, decline of the uh, mother trees and but some uh, increase of shepherding. but. Important thing is the, the, there is no statistical significance, which means we cannot make any firm conclusion whether overall like a mother tree increase or decrease by the, uh, in, in these regions. And uh, Matt, could you please do uh, next slide, please? Yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Just a minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, one thing is interesting uh, from this study was the there are, we saw some uh, quite a significant variation between side, and if you look at the uh, graph bar graph on the uh, right hand side, this is the difference of the mother coffee stands from uh, 1970s to 2015. I uh, know 2019 to uh, uh, 2015. So if you see this number four and five and 21, 25, 27 and 30 are the one we saw very significant uh, rows of the mother coffee trees. And on meanwhile, we saw the another site uh, called like a site 12 to uh, 17 uh, showing a considerable increase in mother trees. And we, we discussed with the uh, local communities and uh, uh, forest uh, management groups and uh, discussions. And uh, I think we believe the, the factors uh, causing this uh, loss of the, uh, or even gain of this uh, white copy is likely linked to the different communities management practice, like uh, transplanting a white copy, or just simply cutting some of the uh, stem for the home construction or uh, some uh, white coffee they occupy by the farmers, like they regard as like a kind of their own uh, kind of coffee trees there. 
And uh, to follow, because we only had uh, 30 different sites for this uh, preliminary uh, study. So we had a follow-up survey done, just being done. So we're trying to analyze and get more uh, detailed information about the conservation of wild coffee. Okay. And then next slide, please, Matt. Okay, so next thing, uh, uh, another thing we're doing is in Huddersfield is we're trying to monitor the, uh, the coffee forest. So we did a field survey uh, at the site, and then we, we look at the, uh, how this, uh, there's a difference between a natural forest and coffee forest. General, generally, the, uh, the, we see the, the composition and structure of forest is quite different between the natural forest and then coffee forest. We see uh, quite a thinning of the, like a reduction of the canopies in a coffee forest. We see the cutting of undergrowth and heavily managed in that way. And so, so to understand how this uh, coffee forest has been extended over time, we use the satellite observation. And then you, you see the, the images uh, on the bottom bit. So in the uh, left-hand side is the, uh, the, the representing conditions from 1987, uh, 1987 to 1997. And the right-hand side one is representing to, uh, 1999 to uh, 2019. So you will see the, uh, the in the right-hand side, you see a lot of uh, very red colored area. You see a lot of them. So that representing the uh, expansion of this uh, the coffee forest in the area. So, so we, using this kind of techniques, we can kind of see uh, how this uh, coffee forest has been expanded or intensified in a way, like uh, in, in terms of changing uh, this uh, composition and the structure of a forest. And also we doing uh, another set of uh, study and uh, to understand more uh, in, in what's happening in Sheko area. So by the way, this is a different region uh, in, uh, in Southwest in Gera, but uh, we're doing a, another set of study uh, in Sheko to, to understand the changing of the uh, coffee forest. Okay, next slide, please. So, so my personally, uh, I, I traveled to Indonesia in Aceh. So I, I heard yeah, some of uh, the participant is from Aceh. So I kind of trying to show this, uh, my, my thought on the uh, observation I had in Aceh in Ethiopia. So I visited the Aceh, the coffee farms and then uh, processing facilities. I did a drone survey and photographic survey and all these things. What, what, I, what was striking me was the, um, there was a farmer there uh, in Aceh and they actually planted the coffee trees and then also they grow the shade uh, canopy trees. So what he told me is kind of, kind of regeneration of forest due to this coffee uh, plantation. So it was very interesting to see. So that's why I just wanna present that one. And you can see uh, these, uh, the, in the middle bit is uh, from the drone image and you can see the, the small like round things are coffee trees and then you can see the some of the uh, canopy trees and also you can see the processing facility I visited in Aceh. So, so it's, it's I, the one point I'm trying to make is the in, in Aceh I see the uh, coffee can be uh, really uh, with the shade trees can be like a very positive impact on regeneration of, of uh, forest. In the meanwhile, in, in, in Ethiopia, we have to be a little bit careful about the, uh, we see some, uh, the, some changes of the, the forest composition and structure due to the uh, growing of coffee uh, trees in the forest. So this needs to be more uh, investigated in the future. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, all three of you, really fascinating, interesting. I'm really glad that we have more time um, later to discuss more and uh, 
have uh, already some question in mind. So, <laughs> but before um, we um, are going there, I will like just to introduce the other part. So we will have um, two uh, short videos um, where we will listen uh, first to a presentation from Rama, who is a chairwoman of Ketira Cooperative in Achegayu. Um, and the second video uh, will be uh, from uh, Harry, who is a chef agronomist and coffee producer at um, Cooperative uh, Frontera San Inacio in Peru. Uh, they will both expose their focus on the forest conservation and uh, their agroforestal coffee farm management. Uh, so it will be um, different of what we listen because in this case it's more on how uh, they try to conserve natural, uh, natural forest along with uh, coffee farm uh, management. So enjoy uh, these uh, videos and then we'll come back to me uh, next to start uh, the Q&A. Thank you. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu yang saya hormati. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Nah, terima kasih kepada Tom, Priscila, dan Henry dari DRW. Saya Rahmah, saya petani, seorang ibu. Eh, Rahmah lahir dibesarkan di Gayo. Keluarga kami semua petani, petani kopi. Rahmah sendiri sudah berdagang kopi selama kurang lebih 30 tahun. Tahun 2009, kami mendirikan Koperasi Ketiara mulai dengan 35 anggota. Sekarang sudah 1000 petani, kebanyakan perempuan. Ketiara mulai ekspor secara mandiri pada tahun 2012. Kita semua tahu tentang rumitnya persoalan hutan di Sumatera, termasuk juga hutan di wilayah kami di Aceh, di Gayo, mulai dari sawit, pembakaran liar, konflik hewan dengan manusia, kebakaran hutan, dan banyak lagi. Tetapi Rahmah tidak akan bercerita tentang ini. Presentasi Rahmah akan bercerita soal hutan menurut kami petani. Dan apa saja yang menurut kami bisa dan perlu untuk dilakukan. Next. Ini gambar Aceh Tengah di kanan atas Danau Lok Tawar. Di bawahnya kota Takengon ada dua kabupaten di sini yang menghasilkan kopi total 81 ribu hektar dengan kopi kualitas terbaik dan terbesar di Indonesia. Perkebunan kopi akan semakin luas, penduduk semakin banyak, semua orang punya, punya kebun kopi. Kopi adalah pendapatan utama penduduk di Gayo. Persoalan petani kopi itu sangat sederhana, yaitu bagaimana memperoleh pendapatan agar cukup untuk membayar keperluan sehari-hari semakin mahal. Gagal panen berarti bencana untuk enam bulan ke depan. Contohnya sekarang panen turun 40 persen, itu artinya Pendapatan hilang 40 persen. Biaya hidup tetap sama. Di sinilah petani mengambil pinjaman saat sampai panen ke depannya. Keadaan seperti ini terkadang membuat petani memilih jalan pintas daripada buang untuk beli mesin, potong rumput, lebih baik semprot dengan herbi bersih selama tiga bulan. Persoalan petani adalah bagaimana bertahan hidup, hasil panen dan harga tidak menentu. Petani sangat tahu bahwa menebang hutan itu salah, apalagi memberi makan racun pokok kopi. Petani itu juga tahu tidak perlu diceramahi lagi. Bicara dengan petani harus tindakan dan contoh yang sederhana dan mudah. Next. Foto ini cukup banyak ditemukan di Gayo. Hutan berubah jadi kebun, herbi sepanjang jalan kebun, kadang herbi juga digunakan di dalam kebun kopi dan sertifikasi. Next. Ini contoh 
apa yang sudah kami lakukan selama 12 tahun terakhir. Pertama, setiap tahun Ketiara menyisihkan uang untuk tanam pohon. Ada jeruk alpokat, krem besi, pisang, mahoni, dan banyak lagi. Belum lagi training promosi di edukasi. Kedua, soal gliposat. Tiga tahun yang lalu, gliposat ramai di Eropa, terutama di Jerman. Setahun kemudian merembet sampai ke Amerika, penjualan menurun. Rahmah protes mulai dari eh, kepala desa, Pak Bupati, Gubernur, eh, sampai ke Menteri di Jakarta, tetapi belum ada hasilnya. Contoh lain dan Rahmah paling suka adalah lebah. Binatang lembut ini luar biasa. Mereka berperan dalam penyerbukan, membuat bunga menjadi buah, dan buah dimakan oleh burung dan di pritama, dan biji sisanya menjadi pohon-pohonan baru. Next. Rahmah juga mau cerita eh, soal langkah kecil kami yang baru dengan DRW, Kopi Hutan Ketiara. Ketiara Hutan adalah produk dari petani perempuan di Bias dan desa lainnya. Ada di ketinggian 1.200 sampai 1.600. Setiap kopi yang diterjual disisihkan 10 sen per LBS dikelola oleh ibu-ibu petani untuk beli bebet. Direncanakan 10 jenis pohon, 5 jenis pohon ditanam sebagai naungan dan 5 jenis pohon untuk tanaman di hutan. Next. Terakhir, terima kasih. Demikianlah presentasi Rahmah. Sebagai penutup, ini sedikit tentang Ketiara. Kunjungi website Ketiara lebih detail. Terima kasih. Salam hangat dari Ketiara Kopi. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buen, hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Harry Lo Yarzabona Cárdenas. Soy ingeniero agrónomo de profesión y trabajo desde años en la cooperativa Agraria Frontera San Ignacio, ¿no? denominada COPAXI. ¿no? Eh, soy responsable del, del departamento técnico en la actualidad. ¿no? Eh, si vamos a hablar un poco de la cooperativa, vamos a mencionar quiénes somos. ¿no? Nuestra cooperativa se encuentra ubicada en América Latina, específicamente en Perú, país, eh, departamento de Cajamarca, provincia y distrito de San Ignacio, ¿no? Somos eh, 100% productores, cafetaleros, ¿no? Eh, nuestra cooperativa hasta la actualidad tiene 53 años de vida institucional y es una de las pioneras en la zona norte del Perú, ¿no? Contamos con 421 pequeños productores, caficultores, cumpliendo los criterios orgánicos, mercado justo y certificaciones sostenibles, ¿no? Eh, nuestra prioridad es mejorar la calidad de vida de nuestros socios, y conservar el medio ambiente, como son los bosques, la flora y la fauna de nuestra zona. ¿no? Eh, la zona productora eh, se encuentra ubicada en el margen de dos áreas protegidas por el Estado, siendo uno el Santuario Nacional Tabaco Nonambaye y el Bosque Chinchiquía. ¿no? Son zonas intangibles y productoras de la conservación de árboles y animales en extinción, como es el oso de anteojos, el tapirandino y el gallito de la roca. ¿no? Estamos enfocados en la conservación de la flora y fauna, haciendo convenios con el Estado y algunos clientes importantes como, como nuestros amigos, el doctor Guacrofien. Eh, para ellos, nosotros nos enfocamos mucho en conservar las especies de árboles de sombra oriundos de la zona, como son el romerío, el acerío, entre otras especies que son eh, oriundas de la zona, los, como los anteojos, el aito de las rocas, el tapirandino, eh, cuyos nombres nos promocionan en nuestras marcas de nuestro café. ¿no? Entonces, eh, como cooperativa, venimos mucho enfocados en conservar la flora y la fauna. ¿no? ¿No? Nosotros como cooperativa trabajamos en tres zonas, que son la zona, eh, la zona baja, que está entre 850 metros a 1200 metros sobre el nivel del mar, ¿no? en zona media, que estamos de los 1200 a 1400 metros sobre el nivel del mar, y la zona alta que estamos de 1400 
a 2080 a 2100 metros sobre el nivel del mar, ¿no? Entonces, esos son los picos ecológicos que en nuestra cooperativa tenemos nuestros productores, ¿no? En Copaxi eh, se viene trabajando con sistemas de producción agroforestales, hablemos de decir un 80%, y también sistemas parcelas eh, sin sombra, que es un 20%, ¿no? Eh, si hablamos de las especies forestales o árboles maderables que estamos usando como sombra de café, en el café, ¿no? o sombra mixta, que le llamamos nosotros aquí comúnmente, que es el 80%, tenemos tanto eh, especies de la zona y especies exóticas, ¿no? Entonces, hablamos de eh, las exóticas, hablamos del pino tecunami, el eucalipto salignas, el eucalipto de glucta, ¿no? La capirona, el laurel y la shaina, ¿no? Que son especies exóticas, ¿no? Y también tenemos eh, especies, eh, especies que están en peligro de extinción, que son el romerío, el acerío, el atero, el sangre grado, ¿no? Que también lo tenemos asociado con nuestra producción de café, ¿no? En las zonas altas, eh, eh, la sombra, eh, eh, trabajamos eh, eh, moderadamente, ¿no? Hablemos de un 25%, ¿por qué? Porque en eh, la zona alta se puede generar, eh, con el exceso de sombra, podemos generar eh, el ojo de pollo, el arañero, la roya, la cercospora, el pienero, ¿no? Que son eh, eh, enfermedades eh, muy susceptibles para el café. Eh, otra parte muy importante, la ventaja de trabajar con café natural nos conlleva a prolongar la vida de, de la planta, eh, en el incremento de la fértil del suelo, materia orgánica, eh, hay una microfauna en el suelo y entre otros aspectos muy importantes que podamos nosotros eh, explicar. ¿no? Y una de las ventajas también de trabajar con este sistema eh, de café sin sombra eh, están, ¿qué pasa cuando nosotros trabajamos eh, el café sin sombra, el café desnudo, ¿no? Eh, un factor muy importante que a la planta lo exigimos demasiado, el suelo se, se explota demasiado. No, eh, señores eh, eh, que me están eh, sintonizando, he tratado de dar una breve explicación del trabajo que realizamos como cooperativa. ¿no? Eh, es un pequeño espacio que yo puedo desplayarme, por, ¿no? Eh, no sé, les agradezco la atención prestada deseándole recibir alguna sugerencia sobre mi trabajo y con gusto yo contestaré cualquier pregunta que tengan, ¿no? Muchas gracias y especialmente un saludo desde Perú para todos que nos están viendo. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you. Thank you, Harry and, uh, and Harana for your presentation. Um, well, so I, um, I'll start with a question. Um, it will be more uh, about the first presentation we had. Um, so as we all know, you know, we are mentioning a lot about uh, in the coffee industry about the forest, important forest, but as well like forest coffee. And I guess it's quite important uh, to, if you can explain a bit more in detail or like the differentiation more here on what really how you differ because you mentioned about the wild uh, coffee, wild forest coffee, uh, forest coffee uh, managed by farmers. Um, and then you have like garden coffee. So I think it would be good if really you can explain briefly the differences and um, as well on term of the ownership, uh, because I guess on the wild forest coffee, uh, who does it belong to, you have the ticker to come. So how in terms of the revenue, uh, where it's going and how it is distributed, where if you have a semi-forest coffee, where there is a piece of land won by, farm, by a farmer, then some of revenue is going to this farmer. So can you tell more about this, how it's organized, like Matt or Professor Wood? Yeah, thanks, Priscilla. The main source of coffee that is marketed, as, as Matt was showing, is that which comes from what we call coffee forest. This is forest which has been manipulated quite considerably in terms of canopy reduction, understory removal and planting up with coffee. Um, what has happened in Southwest Ethiopia is that uh, since the mid 1990s and the government that came in then, um, there has been uh, arrangements to support more private sector initiatives. And although the forest is all the property of the people of Ethiopia, 
individuals have been able to obtain areas of natural forest and convert it to coffee forest on payment of an annual tax to the local government office. So they get use rights, not permanent rights, they get use rights in order to develop this coffee forest. And those people who've done that are often people who've got uh, connections, either uh, family connections or financial connections with the uh, people in the administrative offices who give out these rights to take areas of natural forest and convert it to coffee forest. But maybe Matt wants to add something more to that. Uh, Sorry, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, I suppose the only thing really that I would add is just um, so, so nothing in terms of the, of the, the, the history and the, the, the actual rights, um, as, as Adrian's described, but more what you see visually when you when you are actually in the forest. So to, to get into what I was referring to as the, the wild forest and we've we've um, we spent quite a bit of time debating <laughs> different types of ways of, of, of referring to the forest, lightly managed, intensively managed, etc. But when you go into the, the deep forest, as I say, I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary. It's, it's almost impenetrable. Uh, it's nothing like the, the woodlands or forests that we have around here, because there's just such a rich undergrowth and biodiversity and at, at every level that you'd expect within a forest, you sort of got to hack your way through. Um, and then, as I, as I tried to allude to, it kind of bleeds out then into this much more intensively managed forest that, that Adrian talked about. But I think the further, as you might anticipate, the further that you are from, um, I guess, mule paths or homesteads or, or village centres, the more likely you are to have some non-coffee forest uh, undergrowth. Um, uh, and, and the closer you are, you know, the more it, it's, it's just coffee, really. Um, so will you see like in the wild um, coffee forest, like maybe you will tend to get less after like coffee trees coming, like if it's more in the wild and then compared to those, like you will still have more biodiversity and, you know, because you mentioned about like one of the challenging, it will be like the biodiversity. Um, so do you refer to like the lack of biodiversity or to be like more, for example, in the fresh coffee to become too much more coffees and maybe the same genetic? Because you said you have a lot of wild different um, coffee gene. So how many actually, how many different coffee gene are identified, you know, of all of them? I guess, you know, <laughs> there is like a few of them that are like identified or how, how it is, I guess it's like a huge project, but yet really interesting because do you have like as well new gene that coffee gene that are pairing as well along the years with natural mutation? Yeah, um, you're right that it's a, a big project and there has been work specifically on coffee genetic diversity within uh, various uh, areas of wild, uh, various uh, bodies of wild coffee across all of Ethiopia. Um, one thing that came out of that was that Sheko area, which is where we've been working, has particularly uh, distinct char genetic characteristics, but that is not something which we've, we've been working on. One thing which we are not informed about but are concerned about is where people rather than taking seedlings from the natural forest and planting those up where they're bringing in improved varieties from government uh, nurseries and then planting those up we don't know what impact that is going to have upon the uh, the genetic characteristics in this coffee forest area and one of our consultants made a study that really the bulk of the coffee uh, genetic uh, gene pool is in the coffee forest where these nut wild plants have been brought and concentrated. And actually that is is very important gene pool, although of course it is at risk because of the concentration from disease or whatever, and not able to evolve naturally like the in-situ conservation of wild coffee 
in the nat deep in the natural forest where it can just get on and do what it does naturally. So there's big debates about ge the geometric genetic issues. One one thing just to add, which, which is it, it's not about the genetic diversity per se, Priscilla, but it's uh, it's just anecdotally from speaking to the the coffee farmers is um, that um, several of them are quite open about the fact that they like to mix both the uh, improved variety that Adrian was referring to with the transplanted seedlings from the wild um, because they find that the improved varieties are higher yielding, are easier to pick because they tend to grow um, at just an easier height and they're more dense but they only provide a yield for about three or four years and they're much more susceptible to um, uh, baboon um, uh, kind of attack. Whereas the wild varieties don't provide such good yields. They're taller kind of stringier plants, but they, they last for longer and they are more resistant to kind of local animal uh, um, you know, manipulation or whatever. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I guess, um... <clears throat> I will ask another question about our audience. You know, like we had quite a few as well, so I will make sure I don't miss them. Um, we have one question from Dave, um, who is asking about your mention uh, in the presentation. As a white forest coffee, uh, you are giving specialty grade grade two, so what it's due to the defect or flavor that it could not be a grade one. Basically, why did you? How it has been qualified as grade two and not grade one because of the defect account or the flavor so <clears throat> the short answer to that Dave is, is uh, I don't actually know that was the year before I joined Huddersfield um, so uh, but I, I think the main thing that um, that came out of the grading was that or, or at least that I took away from it was that there hadn't really been this attempt to um, grade and improve the harvesting techniques from Benchecco or as it was at the time Bench Magi. So it wasn't like, say, I don't know, Sidama or Yirgachev and these ones that had a, a, a stellar reputation for some time. It was it it was trying to and has been trying to find its place alongside other more established. Uh, coffees, I would say. The reason for it getting a, a specialty grade two rather than one, um, I don't know. I could try and find out for you. Adrian, you, you, do you know? No. Um, I, I have a small, like, the observation on that topic. Um, maybe it's, on, it's on my own, like, a, a kind of impression uh, between the Ethiopia and Indonesia I visited. So, I, I think the, uh, the processing maybe rule uh, some play or some part on that because what I saw in Indonesia were like a very clean uh, kind of processing compared to Ethiopia in some degree. Uh, Matt, just uh, tell me if it's not correct, but that's my observation I had. So there may be some play or rule on the different grade and, and you see, that's my opinion. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, uh, as well, I wanted to um, add about like the presentation was really interesting, like um, from Rama about uh, in Aceh, uh, you know, where in comparison, where, you know, in Ethiopia, it's really like, you know, like the, 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 the forest and where there is like wild coffee forest, and then there is a management um, as a forest around here, like which provides, you know, like for producers and like who are in Ethiopia, it's more like Dr. Um, Field said really well, like regeneration, where there is really a need and there is a conscious of farmers where we need to protect. There is like forest, like they are owned by government and protected, but then uh, there is as well, you know, like say like coffee plantation, like farm and then there is management and then some trees are cutting out so I wanted to ask um, Rama like how um, really you know um, in terms of like the awareness of farmer what is the work done in terms of education to ensure there is like more and more of this investment in um, reforestation um, you know um, among like the, the coffee farm and as well um, 
how those reserves are kept, you know, as a natural um, forest sanctuary. I don't know if um, maybe um, Agung wants to translate. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I translate uh, via mobile phone to Rahma. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you as well, Agung, like, uh, because we didn't um, introduce, but um, he's uh, Indonesian as well, and he works for um, Fair Trade, um, Fair Trade in uh, Indonesia. So thank you for being here and doing the translation as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't speak Indonesian, so you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> to wait a bit. But... <laughs> or maybe like um Henry, maybe you can do it in Spanish for Harry, the question as well about the importance of the forest while he finished to translate. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um Saludos desde Londres, Harry. Eh, tengo una pregunta acá. Eh, uh, sorry, sorry, Henry. Henry, I'm, I'm, oh, translating, you're, you're, to, I'm, I'm translating via mobile phone through Rahma. Ah, okay. I'll yeah. wait for you then. Voy a hablar en, en un rato, Harry. Uh, enggak, kakak, 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 mikrofonnya dinyalain, videonya dinyalain. Oh. Uh, halo semuanya, selamat malam. Hi everybody, uh, good evening. Mohon maaf, saya tidak bisa bahasa Inggris. I'm really sorry I did not speak English. Saya sudah coba belajar, tapi tetap enggak bisa. I've been try to study, but uh, still I cannot speak English. <laughs> Uh, seperti yang ditanyakan Priscila tadi, terima hmm. kasih. Kami kami juga uh, koperasi kami mempunyai sertifikat organik field trade. Di dalam field trade itu ada program lingkungan. Jadi di dalam program lingkungan kami menyisihkan sebagian dana untuk penghijauan. Jadi setiap uh, setiap di dalam uh, standar field trade ada 25% untuk uh, dana lingkungan. Jadi dana itu setiap tahun habis rat kami sisihkan untuk uh, penghijauan. Pertama uh, umpamanya nanam pisang untuk kami juga bermanfaat, untuk monyet juga bermanfaat, uncunya untuk satwa semua bermanfaat. Kami tanam juga alpokat, ya satwa juga memakan pokat, kami juga makan pokat. Petani itu kami gunakan buah-buahan itu untuk penambahan ekonomi. Translate dulu, Pak. Ya, yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, Priscilla, for your question. As you may aware that uh, our cooperative is uh, fair trade and organic certified. So under fair trade standard. Uh, we have to allocate 25% of the vetted premium income uh, to be allocated for the environmental program. In Ketiara, uh, uh, there are so many environmental programs, like or I already mentioned in my presentations, that we always uh, put aside, aside money uh, to buy seedling. For example, we buy a banana, we buy avocado. So basically, uh, we put our farmers uh, this tree, it, it can benefit uh, to our farmers, but it can also benefit to the uh, wildlife. Uh, jadi kami itu juga sangat menyayangi binatang-binatang, uh, tidak membenci, karena mereka juga butuh makan, kami juga butuh makan. Hanya karena faktor ekonomi, Udah berkembangnya, jadi butuh juga menebang hutan untuk tanam kopi. Kalau enggak kami mau makan apa? Karena di Gayo itu 90% petani semua hidup biaya anak sekolah, biaya sehari-hari, semua dari kopi. Ya, yeah, so basically Rahma saying that uh, we... We are as a farmer, we are understand that we need to taking care of our environment. 
uh, we love animal, we protect animal, but we also care uh, with the people as well. As you may aware, ninety uh, percent, ninety percent of 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 farmer in Gayo is live uh, from coffee, and all of the expenses is paid by the coffee. Uh, so, uh, uh, so sometimes, uh, sometimes. I'm very sad uh, that we see the farmer cut off the tree just to open a small farm so they can feed to the family. So basically, Rahma said that there are two things which is important. Uh, first, that the farm that the farmer need to earn enough income so they can feed their family, but also they need to taking care of uh, the environment. So the the first the farmer first, then the environment. Uh, jadi dengan berkooperasi itu kita uh, dapat banyak dapat ilmu juga dengan uh, mempunyai sertifikat organic filtrat saat di audit memang kita harus menjaga hutan makanya kami di kooperasi itu punya program lima pokok untuk uh, hutan lima untuk kami di kebun jadi kebun itu bermanfaat untuk Pertama untuk pelindung, yang kedua juga berpengaruh ke cita rasa kopi. Makanya kopi gayun itu enak, kata Q Grader, bukan kata Rahmah. Ada rasa pokat, ada rasa jeruk, ada rasa coklat, jadi bervariasi di dalam kebun, beda dengan kebun yang lain. Kalau di hutan juga memang itu kami sudah lima tahun mulai menanam-menanam, mudah-mudahan penghijauan untuk di gayu sudah bagus. Yeah, so basically we learned a lot from the certifications, uh, whether organic and fair trade, because uh, in the certifications, they are they, they strictly regulated that we need to uh, to protect our uh, ecosystem or our environmental. That is the reason uh, every year uh, our cooperative, we grow uh, five types of trees. Uh, five trees is for the shade and five trees is for the forest. And I like to emphasize that the shadow tree is a very important, not just for the forest, but also to improve the, uh, the cup profile of the coffee. Uh, that, is, that is the reason why uh, Gayo coffee, they, they have a profile of orange, they have a profile of chocolate, and so on. Terakhir, terima kasih untuk DRW yang sudah menyumbangkan dana untuk penghijauan di, 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 di Gayo. Jadi itu sangat membantu petani karena kami sudah punya modal lagi selain dari lingkungan, sudah dapat bantuan dari DRW akan kami mulai nanti penanaman. Begitu Priscila datang, kami akan tunjukkan pohon yang kami tanam. Uh, the last, uh, I would like to say thank you so much for uh, DRW, Dr. Wakefield. Uh, that provide uh, that provide fun uh, to to plan a new seedling. Uh, when Priscilla came to our region, I will so I will I will take Priscilla to see the trees that uh, funded from uh, uh, Dr. Wakefield. Um, thank you very much, Dedi Um I'm just going to quickly now turn to Harry and Peru, and we're also going to enter the breakout room. So basically, in 10 minutes, we've got the next talk which is about relationships and coffee. So we're going to head, head to the breakout room and just finish um, 10 more minutes of questions.